First of all, uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to be part of your class today and inviting me in. I know that you think that maybe the invitation wasn't extended by you, but I would like to think it is extended by all of you. And I know that uh, as I would you in my classroom, you'll welcome me with open arms and we'll have a good time here in the next oh, 30 to 45 minutes. I apologize ahead of time uh, for two things. First, I move rather briskly as we go through this because I'm on a a bit of a time crunch and I want to get through a lot of material before I have to go and second I apologize to leave a little bit early but I had a, another commitment prior to making this commitment and this was the only one that really fit into the calendar for me well and maybe you'll understand why when I talk a little bit about the program I'm here to talk to you uh, today about report writing and how that may serve you well uh, in any uh, career that you uh, any pathway you go down but especially in criminal justice and uh, and or any uh, any other uh, employment that has anything to do with uh, human behavior because it's all about reporting and reporting accurately and with many different uh, consumers of that product and so I know you already know a lot of this I'm not an English major uh, I, I, I would say that I'm an expert at reviewing at writing and reviewing reports because I've authored many in my in my career and then as a supervisor I reviewed a lot but I, I certainly uh, was more interested in not, uh, I was always interested in good English and punctuation and the, and the rules of writing, but I was more interested in how the story was told. Uh, and I think it'll make more sense to you as we go through uh, this presentation. This is the exact same presentation that we give at the Academy. So today we're all at the Academy, if you want to think of it that way, that you are for at least the next uh, whether it, <laughs> it be something you would like to be or not, but for the next 30 to 45 minutes, we'll, we'll go to the police academy and you'll see what we teach our very brand new recruits. And it's not rocket science by any, any means. Uh, it is the basic report writing presentation. So uh, before we get started on that, I'll share a little bit of my background with you, not to stand up here and toot my horn and, and try to make me sound like all coast almost because I'm not. I usually learn more from my students than then my students, students learn from me as a whole because I have quite a few students over the uh, course of a, of a year. Uh, I'm, I'm currently the uh, instructor coordinator for the law enforcement program here at the College of Western Idaho, relatively new program. Uh, we are in our uh, second year, our third year actually just started. Uh, we are in class four. We have four, the fourth class over at Canyon right now. They should be home by now. I had to leave them in the hands of an attorney who was teaching criminal law today, so I hope that he didn't overtax them and make them stay any longer than they had to today. So they should be on their way home, but class four and class five starts for us in the spring semester. So you can see we're a relatively new program, less than three years old, but based on the bones of a program, started at the College of Southern Idaho in 1965. Uh, so it, the same structure of the program that has weathered all those years and proven to be effective in training and uh, producing what I would like to think are well-trained, empathetic, and uh, uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, well-trained and empathetic officers. So uh, I, my, my background, I started uh, law enforcement. I had a two-year degree in uh, police science from a, a college in California, Modesto Junior College, right in Central Cal. I grew up there. You may or may not be familiar with the area, but there's all the academies in California are located at the community college. Uh, most of the community colleges have academies that are regional academies. So I took advantage of the law enforcement program there, uh, although it was probably preordained as most all my brothers and my father were all from law enforcement backgrounds. So having heard the stories over my whole lifetime, it was hard to depart from what had become kind of a family culture um, and uh, I couldn't resist trying my hand at it myself. Uh, I, I had a two-year degree. I flew up to Idaho because my brother was currently a sergeant at the Jerome County Sheriff's Office, a small little hamlet located on the other side of the Prime Bridge from Twin Falls. If you've been down there, it's a, one of the smaller counties, but it has about 65 miles of interstate that runs through the county, which means that it's a lively place to work because lots of things happen on the interstate, including transportation of uh, drugs, uh, human trafficking, I could tell you a lot of stories about things that happen on the interstate as well as Highway 93 runs a good portion from north to south through that small county uh, and that is a main artery of course not only to fund in the in the snow but uh, also a northern drug trafficking route so we were quite busy 
in the early days uh, when the war on drugs was, I guess, new, fairly new and hot. So I went in 1978, I flew up here, and now you're doing the math. I know you are, you're doing the math. 1978, you think, gosh, is anybody still alive that was even living in 1978? Yeah. I'm right here for you. Uh, so I did about, uh, long story short, I did about everything you could do in law enforcement, including uh, work for the uh, state drug task force. So in my resume, I'd, I'd say I bought and sold drugs all over the state of Idaho, and I'd see explanation anytime I apply for a job, which hasn't been much because I held on to city, county, and state jobs uh, for the first 10 years on the street, and then I worked 15 years for probation and parole as a senior probation and parole officer. And I, th I thought that that was probably something many of you might be interested in at some point in your career. It's a very rewarding job. It is a fine line between law enforcement and social work. And good officers know how to do both in that occupation. Sometimes we're a little bit heavy on the law enforcement side, I found, in probation and parole. But certainly have become more uh, acquainted with programming and, and uh, trying to uh, make sure that individuals are, are able to stay in communities and, and weather whatever storms they may be going through and become productive citizens or re-engage themselves as productive citizens again. So 15 years with PMP, I know I'm eating some time up here on the introduction, but it's kind of interesting to see what path, you know, pathways are available to you. You never know where you're going. I mean, here I am, and you'll know in a minute just how, what a, a, a strange, as Jerry Garcia has said, what a strange trip it has been, right? Because I did 15 years with PMP. I was all along teaching at the academy, met my, my current uh, uh, colleague, Leroy Forsman, retired Napa police chief teaching at the academy. We were uh, two of five defensive tactics master instructors in the state, so you can guess what we taught. Self-defense, straight stick and reactive impact weapons, OC and aerosol, handgun retention, anything that called for action, we were the teachers, and so that's how I met my colleague. But we always knew that there was a lot more to law enforcement than, than force, right? Although the need for force is sometimes there. We, we thought that great communication was probably the, the, the best skill that any human being can, uh, can uh, refine. And so we worked hard to do that as well. And having said that, we became educators and we worked on our credentialing and, and furthered our degrees during that time at the academy. And we worked full time on the street at, at the same time. So uh, having engaged in, in, uh, in uh, education, I taught for the College of Southern Idaho. I taught some of their criminal justice courses along the way as I was a probation and parole officer. I taught in their law enforcement program. In 2003, I filled a vacant position there as the law enforcement program coordinator, the same job that my colleague, uh, retired Chief Forsman, now holds, and he's my boss. Um, so I did that for about seven or eight years, ran the law enforcement program. I'll be darned, they, they made a mistake and they, they made me a department chair of social science down there. I don't know how that happened. But uh, for three years, I was a social science chair. And I started doing the math, just like you've done some math. And I thought, 78, 2010, let's see what my retirement looks like. And it looked really good. And so I thought, I'm going to pull the plug and retire, but I don't want to quit working. So I pulled that retirement check every month and I dropped an application up here at the College of Western Idaho because it was a challenge. I thought three years ago we weren't accredited yet, right? And it's been a long, a, a long journey to accreditation. I wanted to be a part of that. And they hired me first as assistant dean over business education, exercise, and health science. And a year later, I was the dean over social science and public affairs. I remind Leroy from time to time that I was his boss twice removed, just so you know, at one point, especially when he gets bossy. So anyway, um, I had the opportunity to step back in the classroom a little more than a year ago, and I seized it uh, because that's where my heart really was at, and, uh, and I, I, I wanted another challenge. I wanted a, a opportunity to work alongside uh, somebody I've respected and worked with for many years and establish a law enforcement program that I thought would be second to none in the nation, not only in the state. Our program is full. Uh, we have uh, a very, uh, very successful hire rate. Once students complete our program, they don't have to attend the academy. They are hired by chiefs and sheriffs throughout the state and throughout the western states. They don't have to go to the academy. It makes them a perfect marketable product, right? They're smart. They're fit. They're, uh, they've uh, elevated themselves to challenges and, and that they thought they never could in, in a two-semester program. So 
not so disguised as my other motive here is to encourage you, if you're interested, to come see me about the law enforcement program. Uh, if you're interested, it is, like I say, it would be a great experience for you. And uh, if you're interested in that career and dealing with people and any interest at all, we'd love to have you come and visit with us and see if we couldn't find a good fit for you. Uh, I'll tell you, and you already know this, this occupation is not for everyone, but uh, for the right person, there is no occupation any more rewarding on planet Earth. Uh, we still enjoy a high approval rating, even though uh, our uh, reputations and uh, certainly maybe some of our actions that uh, some officers have taken have certainly warranted some scrutiny over the last four or five years. But uh, I, I was really happy to see the last game of the World Series, if you happen to catch that. Who sang the national anthem? Gee, four Los Angeles Police Department officers, working officers from slick sleeves, no stripes, all the way up to the sergeant. And I thought, wow, uh, that there's a statement there somewhere. And, and uh, uh, I sure enjoyed watching that. I recorded, I had to watch it a couple times myself, okay, uh, for obvious reasons. So today I'm here to talk to you about report writing basics at the end of this short presentation. Uh, I'm probably not going to tell you a whole lot that you don't already know or that doesn't come to you and go, oh, that makes sense, that's common sense. But at the end of this presentation, we will give you a, a, a small assignment. I'm going to show you what I would call a pretty cool video uh, and have you author your own police report on it and see how you do, just for fun. Okay? Uh, the Ten Commandments of Report Writing, we'll start there. The first commandment is never fail to properly document your actions and observations whenever you or your actions affect the life, liberty, or property of others. Gee, I, I mean, that makes sense, right? We gotta write about things we do. We have to document. It is quite a litigious world, but that's not the only reason we document. We document because we report to a, a, a host of individuals in the pursuit of justice. So uh, we make sure that we document anything that we uh, Anytime our actions, observations affect life, liberty, or property. Rule number two, always maintain perspective. We'll, we'll go over each one of these in a little bit more detail. Rule three, always think before you write and avoid police jargon and legalese. One of my favorite uh, reports to read is a new officer who likes to use uh, police jargon in their report. And then I always ask them, do you think anyone else but you or I might know what that means? Uh, we talk about pushing a car, you know, and when we say push a car, in fact, uh, who loves that state? Uh, uh, Blake uh, Mimish, our new learning community coordinator, which isn't even, that's not the title anymore, but he says, what's that term you use about, you know, driving a police car or working in a police car? I said, push a car, you know, we push a car. He says, I always think of you pushing a car, but we have our own terms. We're, we're, we're the largest gang in the world. We have our own colors. We carry firearms, you know, we have our own culture, we have our own language, if you think about it. Uh, so, you know, push a car to me means literally get in, check in on a shift and drive it around. It's amazing how much jargon, police jargon and legalese ends up in some of these reports. It, it can be quite humorous at times. The fourth uh, of the Ten Commandments, field notes are among some of the things that are discoverable items under Rule 16, Criminal Rule 16. So. I tell, I tell officers, uh, take notes. Make sure in your left or right hand breast pocket and make sure you have access to, if you don't have that pocket, a notebook because you'll need to take notes, uh, copious notes at times over these calls. And, and uh, here's the other thing I tell you is that it's all discoverable. Don't write anything in there you're not willing to share with a host of others because they do that from time to time. Words like jerk, uh, uh, profanity end up in their notebook and you can't imagine how many times uh, that gets introduced before a judge, jury, and everyone else that might be interested in taking a look at the case. And it's pretty embarrassing, so I say keep it simple, uh, keep it pertinent, keep it relevant. It's not your, it's not your diary, it is your notebook. So treat it as such. Uh, another, the fifth of the Ten Commandments, field notes and an outline are the first steps in writing an accurate report of the incident, record all relevant facts and strive for accuracy. If you think about the ABCs of report writing, I know I'm scooting along, but we'll get to the meat of the project here in a minute. The ABCs of report writing are accuracy, B is for brevity, and C is for clarity. So I, well, that's what we strive for, accuracy, brevity, clarity. How can we say a lot 
in, with little effort, right? Or in as few words as possible. Always remain objective and avoid the fatal errors of report writing. We'll go over those fatal errors. Strive for clarity and readability. Always proofread your report before submitting it. Wow, I wish, uh, I guess that's good advice no matter what job you're ever in, right? Review, preview, and review and preview and review. So those are the Ten Commandments. We're going to expound and expand on those a little bit. Any questions so far? Okay, here we go. The first commandment again for you. Whenever you become involved in an incident which requires you to take any type of official action which directly or indirectly affects the life, liberty, or property of another person, never fail to properly document your actions and observations. In fact, I would say that anything you do outside of the patrol car any call you go on, there should be some documentation. Most agencies do not require a full-blown police report for, and I'm going to use dog call as an as a example, uh, responding to a dog call requires some type of written documentation, and we usually use a short form for that, but even a barking dog call should have some documentation that you did something, right? We could agree that there has to be some trackable, uh, uh, some trail of evidence of what you did. So the reasons for well-written and objective report writing, and we enter into the interactive portion of the class. <laughs> so feel free to offer any, uh, any ideas about that. There are two basic reasons for a well-written and objective report. Any ideas? It's pretty common sense. I know you know them. You just don't want to be the first one. But one reason would be to? Yes? So it doesn't seem like the officer is biased towards one side. Okay. Okay, it's to inform, right? What else? Here's one. Inform or communicate police activity. They're pretty simple. And the second one is document events. Those are the two reasons. Now, they are not necessarily disconnected, but they aren't necessarily the same either. Inform or communicate police activity and to document events. There are the police activity that takes place in a, in a documented event is not necessarily all about the event itself. It's what the police did and what was happening, why the police were involved. So it's that simple. So the second commandment is always maintain perspective. So when I'm talking about perspective, I need you to ask yourself, why am I writing this report? What, what's the perspective here? Why am I writing this report? Who is my audience? Who is my audience? So the purpose, why am I writing this report, right? Who's my audience, and in what way will this report become a part of a future proceeding? Ah, not everything you document, in fact, many things you document, depending on your profession, remain private, very private. Some things remain, you know, patient, client, uh, uh, doctor privileges, uh, physician privileges, right? A lot of things that you may document in the profession you enter will remain often forever not shared, not so with law enforcement, not so. Who would you suppose might read our reports? Sir? Judges and lawyers. Judges and lawyers. Who else? Police chief. Police chief. Sorry. Okay. Social workers. Social workers. As we go on and on. Who else? Doctors at the station. Yep. Who else? The public. The public. For sure the public's going to read. Because the public is often consists of 12 people or 6 people in a misdemeanor trial, and they're called the jury. And even though they're not allowed to talk about the case in some instances until the, or maybe ever, but at the end of the case, they do talk about the case and they will be part of your audience. So your supervisor, your sheriff or chief, prosecutors, judges and juries, the defense team, ah, the media, wow. So we have seen documentation from police reports, often in detail, uh, no less than where a fatality may have occurred. In law enforcement shootings, the Adams County shooting that took place uh, was in the news for many years. Uh, bits of that police report, large parts of those police reports ended up as public document in the newspaper. So you, you must know that when you author something that anyone and everyone at some point may be reading your report. So the third commandment is always think before you write. That seems like it would make sense, but I tell officers this all the time. I say, think before you write, and especially before you speak, because if it rises readily to the lips or the tongue, it's probably not going to be right. You're probably going to say something 
from uh, an emotion rather than from a professional standpoint. So I would, I would submit to you that you could take that with you through whatever career or personal relationship you may ever have. It's just good advice. If it rises readily to the tongue, stop and take a tactical pause and think about it, uh, right? Because <laughs> we've all said things that we wish we could take back. Same thing goes with what you write. Stop and think before you write because what you write cannot be taken back in any way, shape, or form once that is submitted, right? So think about it. Think about what you want to write. Think about police jargon and legalese. How will I write it? What can I say? What words can I use to convey my message in the briefest possible with, with the uh, least amount of effort and yet leave the reader totally satisfied that they understand what happened, okay? Legalese can cloud a report. For instance, we used to write reports like this, believe it or not. RP was reporting party, the RP, which was actually someone probably with a name. We don't have to use RP because their name is probably Jones, Smith, Reed, whatever, right? We can actually call them that, Reed said, Jones said. So we don't have to use RP because it could be very confusing to you if I wrote RP said or RP advised me you would be like, what's an RP? Well, that's a discussion we don't need to have because I should just use a name. So RP, victim, we still use victim from time to time, but we don't call the victim victim in the report unless they're underage and we need to, for legal reasons, not share those names. Perps, perpetrator, we used to have perpetrator a lot in re reports, the perpetrator. Hard to spell, first of all, uh, right? Uh, if you don't catch it on spell check, it comes out all weird. And in, back in the day, when I started in law enforcement, you know, right back in the 70s, uh, you know, we still hunted T-Rex with sharp sticks burned in fire to make them solid. And uh, it, it just, we didn't always have spell check. We had whiteout. Do you guys remember a thing called whiteout? You, I don't have any anymore. Someone asked for whiteout today, as a matter of fact. And I was like, seriously? It, does it exist? I mean, it does exist, right? Do we use it for art? I don't even know. Does any, is it in a museum? Uh, we don't use whiteout, but so we used archaic terms, this officer, this officer, this officer uh, arrived. Well, who is this officer? If we're reading the report out loud, it could be a number of people with the agency. So we need to be clear. Code 7. We even got into where we were <laughs> writing reports with 10 code in it. Uh, while having a code seven, I was interrupted with a call from dispatch and I was thinking, code seven? Who knows what a code seven? Actually, it's a meal. You're actually taking time out to have a meal, but only law enforcement, not even the judge, not the jury, not the prosecutor would even know what that means. So needless to say, I had a red pen as a supervisor. And as I became a better report writer, because I was never, I don't know that anyone's ever born to be a great report writer. As I became a better report writer, I bled all over everybody's report and I did it gleefully because I had had that done to me. I knew it was a good learning experience because when I got that report back and all I could see was red ink on it, back in the day we wrote these things uh, and then we typed them, uh, the, the, but the proof would, would really be written. I thought, wow, I need to do a better job. So I would bleed on officers' reports and send them back to them and say, that if, you know, if you don't enjoy the red ink, let me give you some examples. The best thing that you can do in any business or any profession you go into, especially in law enforcement, is find great examples. And now, of course, we'd store them electronically or digitally, but we get great police reports. And how do we know they're great police reports? Because supervisors say they are, because prosecutors and judges say, if you want to learn how to write a re police report, talk to this officer or get copies of their reports. So early on in my career, I gathered those and I held them in a big binder in my desk. And you'd be surprised, you don't have to change a whole lot of the verbiage. Uh, the names and dates change, uh, the crimes change, but the way you say things really didn't change a whole lot. So I, I think I became a better report writer, never great, but a better report writer by reviewing those who were great and keeping those at hand. So if you move into social work, whatever business you go into, criminal justice fields, uh, I would recommend that you seek those people out and you store those nice, gems that you can rely on every time to get you through a learning process for you. So uh, avoid police jargon and uh, legalese. The fourth commandment is field notes are among some of the things that we did that already. So they're discoverable. Field notes are discoverable. Okay. I just reiterated that because we're going over each one. But write the report in the first person. Here we get down to some of the nuts and bolts of police report writing or law enforcement report writing. Write it in the first person. We used to say, again, I told you, this officer, 
don't we really mean I? This officer was advised. Don't, couldn't we just say I was advised? Sure, we don't have to use this officer. I'm going to write it because in a discussion with you one-on-one, -on -one, I wouldn't say uh, this officer thinks your shoes look great. Uh, you know, I mean, wouldn't that be an interesting conversation? Uh, always in the third part, I think there was a Seinfeld episode actually on that. And I just roared every time I heard it. Uh, right, Jimmy says, Jimmy likes, right? Remember, it's Jimmy, right? And so I roar every time because I think, man, that's the way we used to write police reports was, you know, Jimmy's not happy about, you know, George saying this. So, uh, you know, you could just say I instead of this officer. So right in the first person, the report writing is not an out-of-body communication experience. It should be written in the first person, which helps to clearly identify who the speaker is, of course, and what action he or she is plainly involved in, right? Makes sense. Write it first person. I is a good a good way to start. Certainly we would not refer to ourselves as this person in a typical conversation. Why would you write it that way? Persons in police reports. Here we go. This is a, I'm going to tell you this is a bad example, but let's read. It sounds pretty good. At, at, at the prima facie, at first face evidence here, it sounds pretty good. A search was conducted of the apartment. Six plastic syringes were located in a brown paper bag on the floor next to the sink. Two more syringes were found beneath the mattress and two burnt bottle caps were located in the top left-hand dresser drawer. All three subjects were then transported to the station where they were advised of their rights. Okay, wow, that sounds kind of good. What, what do you see missing here? Uh, subject names? Yeah, who? When we talk about a uh, search was conducted of the apartment, uh, well, who conducted the search? Who, I mean, were, were they searching their own apartment? They could be, according to this report. Was a neighbor searching their report? You know, did we have, you know, I don't know, who else came up and searched? Six plastic syringes were located in a brown paper. Okay. Two more syringes were found beneath the mattress. Two burnt bottle caps were located at the top. All three subjects were then transported. Well, three subjects, who, who are the three subjects? Have we identified them earlier in the report? Maybe, but even if we had previously identified them, we could still say Smith, Jones, and whatever other person you'd like to pick in there, right? All three. So here's a better revised paragraph. Officer Jones and I conducted a search of the apartment. Officer Jones located six plastic syringes because before we didn't know who located them. Who found what? Very important in criminal cases. Who found what, where, right? Who, what, when, where, how. And then I located two more syringes beneath the mattress, so now we know Jones found two and the other officer, reporting officer found uh, two more syringes. We also know that who transported the three subjects to the station? The officer, the arresting officer, reporting officer. And I would, had I not referred already to those subjects by name, I would make sure that I refer to them by name in that paragraph. Does that make sense? A little, little clearer for you? The first one sounds kind of good, but if you don't know who's involved, you still don't know who's involved. So we have kind of what I call the who done it. You know, who did what? Who did what? So we'll get to who done it in a second. So guidelines for identifying people, fully identify only one time in the report. You don't have to do, uh, uh, Bob Jones uh, was present at the scene. Bob Jones gave me, pretty soon we're gonna be tired of hearing Bob Jones. So you can call Bob Jones simply Jones said. Jones identified. Once you've identified them fully, don't continue to identify them fully again. Avoid labels if possible although Mr. and Mrs. is okay. You can use Reverend, Professor, Doctor, if you like, but you don't have to because you have already identified the last name. If there's more than one person with the same last name, it would be Jones 1, Jones 2, and they'll be referred to in the body of report under suspects or reporting part persons. Make sense? Good. Use the last name. Mr. and Mrs. okay, but not necessary. Avoid subject. We, uh, we use subject a lot in report writing, in law enforcement report writing, but usually subject is always a name. So we'd rather know who we're talking about. What about quotes? Use quotes if it is important to log the exact words that were said. And I'll tell you, it's important. It's always important to log the exact words that were said. If you're going to write a statement in quotes, it should be as exact as you can possibly make it. Today, in today's world, we have video, we have audio recording, so it's easy for officers to go back and refresh their memories. And I tell you, audio and video, the best thing that's ever happened to law enforcement, because if you're not a professional law enforcement officer, 
you won't last and you shouldn't last because anything you do or say under the sun should be open for scrutiny and that's my belief. I think anything I do or say. Now there were times when I said and did things that I wish no one would have heard or saw but yet I would have told you what I did because that's the way you are. You're ethical, right? You need to tell the truth. Now uh, I know that it's not just because of audio and video that officers uh, perform better but it is partly because they know that anything they say or do uh, will be heard and seen and it can be embarrassing. <clears throat> the first big bar fight I was involved in is a little bar in Jerome, Idaho. There's five bars on Main Street to this day in Jerome, Idaho. Anybody from Jerome before I talk about Jerome? Good. Are you? Oh, I thought you were going to say, yeah, I, but there's five bars still today and, and, the, and there's like two blocks of Main Street, right? And uh, they used to get out of control on the weekends. I had a big bar fight and I was went in and, and uh, I had my, at that time in the early 80s, I had a recorder going and I could not tell who the, who the officer and who the bar patrons were. I, uh, well, I let the expletives fly, as Kramer would say, right? I was like, rush, nick a frick, a rock, a schnock, and rock, a schnick, a And I listened to that tape later on in court as the judge was listening to it and the judge was up there like, you know, is that you, Miss Reed? Yeah, that's me, Judge. Hmm. Is that you, Miss Reed? Yeah, that's me, Judge. Hmm. And I thought, man, I learned a big lesson, right? And I, I mean, I let my emotions overwhelm me. I was young and, and not totally understanding the scope of what my job was about. My job was to be professional, courteous at all times, friendly to, not, to no one, but courteous always, right? In the middle of a bar fight now, I'd call him sir, ma'am, you know, whatever it happened to be because that's the right thing to do, right? And so that audio taught me uh, if, if I was going to use quotes on someone else, I had to write what I, was, what I replied to in quotes, and I had to be accurate. Nowadays, we know exactly what was said. Back then, not so much. Exact words show the intensity and meaning of the actual statement. Changing words in a quote may lose something in the translation, right? So, it's hard though. It's hard to write an exact quote for some individuals because in the heat of passion and with emotion involved, people say some of the most awful things that you can believe. New officers and law enforcement students are reluctant to describe what I would call a colorful incident verbatim. Uh, the suspect's speech was very loud, hateful, and disrespectful to this officer. Okay, that's a nice way of saying something else, right? So a judge and a jury would find it interesting. What would be the next question? They would want to know what they say. You might as well lay it all out there so you don't have to answer that question because at some point if it goes to court and it'll likely go to court if you write things like this because the defense attorney would say hmm I have an inexperienced officer here I have an officer who does not want to say some of these things why would that be well obviously I can get that officer on the stand and I might be able to <laughs> dice that person up a little bit confuse the case or win the case simply based on something the officer did inappropriate so if you write things like this in a police report, it's an invitation to visit the witness stand. It just is. So you might as well let it, let it flow as it was said. The officer should have written precisely what she, he, heard, or observed. Now, of course, I'm not going to use any profanity in this slide. Look, I use blanks. Not that I'm not comfortable with it, but if this was the police academy, I would probably use the words. But as so not to offend you and let you use your imagination, which is more important nowadays anyway is that I left a blank. Smith screamed at me, you're a blank pig. In fact, you are an ugly, stupid blank pig. This removes all doubt about what was said, right? It is not taken out of context. It is simply a fact as the officer heard or recorded that. It clears up any questions that judge, jury, uh, defense attorney, prosecutor, and anybody in the gallery would have about what was said. More on that. The officer says, may I see your driver's license? The suspect says, I'm not showing my driver's license to the damn cop. Now get out of my face. You need to put that. And this happens, you know, more often than one would like to think it happens. People are not ever happy about getting pulled over, I don't think. And often they'll say something that they wouldn't normally say. But it's important if you are going to document it, to document it exactly as said. Makes sense? All right. Accuracy, brevity. Clarity. So identifying property, just touching on this very quickly, describe property completely. Uh, the, you are trying to paint a picture 
of property for individuals that you may not have, fo you know, may not have photographs of the property. So you have to describe it completely. Place a value, if at all possible. If you need to, use a sketch or a photograph if available. The fifth commandment, field notes and an outline are the first steps in writing an accurate account of the incident. Take notes, take field notes, and use them. And take notes every time you possibly can. Seven essential elements to any report writing. I bet you know these, right? Who, what, when, where, why, and if possible, how. In law enforcement, it's important to know how. Uh, if someone gained entry into an apartment, we'd like to know who, what, when, where, why, but also how that happened. Uh, and beyond speculation, we need to make sure that whatever we put in the report is not a conclusion, but a fact report. It's a factual report, not a report of conclusions. Conclusions are made by judges, juries, and other folks. Officers do not need to make conclusions in reports because they are reporters of fact, the courts are finders of fact. So we'll go into a little bit more about how important it is not to put conclusions in your report. So what action was taken would be another, what, what was the follow-up? One extra thing. Communicate, not confuse. Communicate, do not confuse. The primary function of writing a police report is to clearly and effectively communicate in chronological order who, what, when, where, why, and how. It is not meant to astonish the reader with big words and or redundant babble. For example, how could the following sentence been written more clearly? Now this is an actual sentence from a police report. I want you to know it is. And this was it. It should be noted, according to this officer's constitutional right to deny a person their freedom, I physically placed Mr. John James Smith III into official detention. There you go. I arrested Smith. A little simpler. If we had not identified him earlier in the report, we would say John James Smith III, right? There it is. It's interesting how we, we all would like to be uh, novelists, right? We do. We, we aspire, especially those who feel like they have an ability to write well or have learned how to write well. Uh, they want to be a novelist when it comes to f reporting facts, and it's tough to just say, Facts, nothing but the facts, right? Keep it simple. The other S I'll leave for you because I think if you've heard this rule before, you know what the other S stands for, but it's keep it simple, right? The KISS principle. New officers start their careers thinking they need to amaze and impress their coworkers with complex sentences. The opposite is true. Uh, keep it straightforward. The majority, not the minority, should have the same comparative understanding of what the officer is communicating to them. So. Other officers will understand what the officer is trying to say if they talk in legalese, police jargon, and maybe in some type of sentence or paragraph like we just read. But the, the majority of individuals will not. The majority of individuals are not typically reading police reports day in and day out. So keep it simple, but keep it comprehensive. So notes should also include key phrases or buzzwords, statements, evidence collected. Makes sense, events and actions, sketches and pictures. So notes should have lots of stuff in there that you're willing to share. So here I come back to the who done it, referring to persons in your report as reporting party, witness number two, suspect number four, property number three, vehicle number one, subject Smith, all confusing. No need to say this. No need to put things like this. It's guaranteed to give a prosecutor a headache when use a person's name, Smith, instead of suspect number two or witness number one. This applies to property as well. If an officer, for instance, is referring to a specific vehicle, he or, she sh he or she should write GMC Envoy instead of vehicle number one, Ruger Handgun instead of property number three. Because see, attached to your report, you list property and you list vehicles. So officers have a tendency to go back and say, vehicle number three. Well, if you're reading the report, you have to flick back to the report. And, oh, vehicle number three was a GMC envoy. Why not just put it in the body of the report? Keep it clear, keep it concise, even though you may be reporting it in the report somewhere else as vehicle three, simply because it's listed there. So keep it simple. 
Another one, a search was conducted of the condominium. Three loaded Glock Model 19s were discovered between the mattress and a loaded Desert Eagle handgun was discovered in the bottom drawer of the dresser. All three subjects were transported to the PD and advised with their rights. After waiving their rights, the subjects admitted they received the guns from another subject and it was determined they knew the guns were stolen. Mm, interesting. So, you know, not the worst bit of writing I've ever seen, but why wouldn't they say this? A search was conducted. When? Who conducted it? Weapons were discovered. Who found them? What mattress were they found in? Was it in the, the master bedroom, upstairs bedroom? We can't reconstruct anything from this statement other than to say somebody found some guns, basically. Over here, if we fill in who, what, when, where, why, how, it's easy for us to paint a picture, and that's what we're actually doing for individuals who are not present at the scene. We're painting a picture for them. We're really more like the outline, the crayon outline, right? If we had a box of crayons, law enforcement would be, if you use a black outline, uh, would be the outline crayon. Let the prosecutor fill in the color, right? Let the witnesses fill in the color because what we're doing is just presenting a structure. This is what happened. This is factual, what I know. Why they did it, not sure not reaching conclusions in my report. That's not my job as a police officer, right? So we are the black crayon. We're gonna make sure that all the lines are there and let everybody else fill in things that we don't need to be dealing with. Okay, create an outline. We got that. The sixth commandment, record all relevant facts. Facts versus conclusion, here's what I wanted to get to. When writing reports, avoid falling into traps which appear to be conclusions. Conclusions are for judges and juries. Conclusions, guesses, hunches, and other thought processes do not belong in reports. Stick to the facts. A statement like, he was aggressive, won't stand up in court. And yet you think that you would read that a lot in a law enforcement report, right? He was aggressive. Even Smith was aggressive. Let's use the name like we should. Smith was aggressive. Well, what does that mean? What's the next question a judge or a jury is going to ask you? How was he aggressive? So doesn't this make it better? I don't know if he was aggressive or not, but he did clench his fists and kick a chair. See how he didn't arrive at the conclusion, simply report the fact. Let everybody else come to their own conclusion because that's the way it should be. We're not here to tell you what we think. We're here to tell you what we know and what we saw, what we heard, what we smelled, right? Okay, so it's a bit of a challenge because many of you have you know, maybe wonderful authors and able to, you know, the night was dark. No, it wasn't dark. It was, let's see, it's always dark. Of course the night was dark. If you haven't seen Billy Crystal go through that, Mama, throw Mama from the train, you need to watch that because it's hilarious. He's a very frustrated writer and he starts out, the night was dark. Well, of course it was dark. Then he talks to himself the whole movie about the first line. He can't crank out the first line. So if you are a gifted writer or feel like you are good at authoring reports or, or written word, or document or text, this is kind of a challenge. Begin with the outline form, that makes sense. We kind of do that when we write a story. Arrange information in chronological order. Keep the report simple, proofread your report. The seventh commandment, always remain objective and avoid the fatal errors of report writing. Here we go, what are the fatal errors? Of course, as this young man mentioned over here, bias, right? You gotta be objective. You cannot be subjective. It is not for you to decide why somebody broke into a residence. It's not for you to, describe, to decide what emotion they are feeling, only what you see, what you hear, and what they say. Words that bring unnecessary emotion into report. Assumptions, omitting substantive evidence. Ooh, gee, we do that in reports sometimes. I've read reports and I go back, and the officer has a great cover for that. And the cover typically, I'll, I'll tell you what the sentence is when they forget to put something in there. It may show up in the report later and it may not because some officers are lazy and they'll leave out important information. So those of us who have reviewed reports have to read between the lines and say, ah, something's missing here. Ah, what, am, what, are, what are they missing? They forgot to tell me this. So I'd send the report back and say, tell me this. And I, was, I forgot that and I was gonna add it later. But, you know, and then I thought, oh, the report's due. You're going to be mad at me because I haven't, I got 24 hours of Smith report. I'm more upset that you left out something that could be important. May, may seem trivial, but could be important. So strive for clarity, readability. Clarity and readability means good use of verbs. Of course, paragraphs, pronouns, choosing language that makes sense and punctuation count. Key elements of a use force report. This 
has a little bit more to do with the video that I'm going to show you here in just a minute or two. It is a use of force incident from cops. You may have seen it. I love this use of force incident because, well, first of all, it's interesting and they taste somebody, which, you know, is interesting, but the officers are so professional and I've seen tase videos before where the officers were not that professional. So you'll see that this all turns out okay. This all turns out as it should, I guess, in this situation with just the proper, in my opinion, the proper use of force, uh, the proper use of verbal persuasion prior to the use of force, which I think is very important. Uh, and you'll, you'll kind of come to your own conclusions, but you are going to write a little bit about a use of force because you will be the backup officers responding to this scene. So your report, I'll give you a, a head start and I'll give you the first line of your report that you might want to consider using. You certainly don't have to, but I'm going to help you out here in just a second. So stay tuned. We're doing good. So descriptions of the environment count, how the technique or force option was applied. You'll see that. That'll be easy for you to report on. Explanation of why the method, technique, and level of force was used, not what the method was. So why? Why did, they, why did these officers use force? That's, that's important, right? Why did they use force? What is said, what is not said, right? Okay. Describe the person's behavior and actions that nece necessitated the force. Identify the officer versus threat factors and the influential circumstances that necessitated the level of force and description of the threat's physical size and appearance. This is important <laughs> because you will not help you cannot help but write about this person's physical size in this report, okay? You'll see what I mean when you see it. So it'll all come to you. Now, have a little fun with this, please. Have a little fun with this. It's not that serious because it's your first police report. Anybody authored a police report before as they reporting RP? Yeah? See, I used RP right there. So you've done it, so you should not have any fun with this. You should really give me something good. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, have fun with it. But have some fun with this. And Anything to add or delete from what I've said? You good? Okay. Uh, so just kind of report what you see. Keep it simple. Uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you choose a few things in a second. Description of the scene in detail. I don't know how much detail you can go into on this because, you know, there's some, but it's dark. So description of the first aid post-force care that was given to the person. Uh, might see some of that. And in, this is a little more jargon for law enforcement, and Graham v. Connor, which is a great interesting case that was all about a little bit of a misunderstanding. Uh, but it is a landmark law enforcement case. We don't have time to discuss it right now, but that's why it's in this PowerPoint, because I told you this is the Law Enforcement Academy PowerPoint. Uh, and they get more than this. I'll tell you, this is the basic report writing. Ninth Commandment, always proofread before submitting. Tenth Commandment, preview and review. What's a good start for your report? I would, might start out with I. Right, because we don't need to say uh, reporting party or this officer. We start at I, on, date and time, received a call to, reference to, and the crime. Upon my arrival, I saw, and then the story begins, right? You might want to use that as just your kickoff because we're starting with who, what, when, where, why, right? And we're answering a lot of those questions in the very first sentence or two. So for this exercise, you are officer whoever you are. Right? Uh, today's date and current time. So I guess we're going to go with, you know, sometime around 450. You could be 451 if you want to be really cool, 452. So uh, location, let's just say 111 Main Street. Let's call it Main Street. It actually happens in a parking lot, but let's say 111 Main Street. And the crime is disturbing the peace. And I'll pull the video up. So you know what the little thing out of his pocket is, right? Because <laughs> Todd, get the little thing out of your pocket. You know what's coming, right? Or at least we think we do. So you are the backup officer from this perspective, okay? We'll play it twice. Relax. It's not that long. 327. Put your arms out. Oh my, put your arms out. 
Okay, Sean Connery, uh, The Untouchables, old movie. If you haven't seen it, you gotta see it. But this is his line, here endeth the lesson, right? So here endeth the lesson. Now, I'm gonna play it one more time, but I, there's some things that, I, that I'd like to point out to you that you would know as a police officer that these guys did right. Uh, I didn't see anything that they did wrong. They tased him twice. Did you, did you see that? Uh, that he had, he tased once and went down. The probes are still in, and then he said, hit him again. So from an officer's perspective, he gave him another five seconds because each, each trigger pull is five seconds, basically. So, um, and it's 50,000 volts, but it comes from a nine volt battery, basically. Isn't that crazy? Nine volt battery, how does that work? Anyway, let's go down the hall and ask somebody who knows what You guys maybe know, I don't know. But anyway, from an officer's perspective, he was still, not active resistance, not fighting, but he was resisting because he wouldn't bring his hands out from underneath. And that's when it gets critical for officers is when they can't see hands and he was laying on his other hand. So he said, hit him again. And then with a little help, they got his other arm out. Now maybe he couldn't pull his arm out regardless. So they did tase him twice. He, I think he almost got tased three times, but they got the arm out. Notice they used two sets of handcuffs, right? That disparity in size between officers and, and this guy. This guy, uh, in real life, what he had been doing is he had done some malicious destruction of property in the parking lot. But you don't get to see all that, so disturbing the peace is a nice way of saying, basically he was breaking some stuff up out there. They knew he was probably gonna go to jail, he was gonna go to jail. And they, I think they tried some good communication skills first, you know, hey, relax, take it easy. You could see his mitts on the back of the trunk. It's kind of scary how big his hands were. It's like, hmm. But a, uh, an appropriate use of force, you decide. Uh, remember, you are not drawing any conclusions. You're just reporting facts here as the backup officer, right? What you saw, what you heard. Taylor, right now you're under arrest for failing to stop and signal by the police. Relax your hands, relax your hands. So he's failed to yield to stop when signaled by the police. He actually, what they charged him with was failing to uh, obey a lawful order because they had told him to stop in the parking lot because they knew he was associated with this dest destruction of property and he had kind of fled. And so they caught him at the car there and he decided to cooperate for a little bit. So when you quote him in your report, you can put a blank there because we don't know exactly what he said, but I'm pretty sure we know what he said. But it's up to you, you can put a blank since they bleeped it out, right? But you would typically write exactly what he said. Yeah, yeah. 
the signal by the police. Stop. You understand you're under arrest. Okay, if you get that far in your report, you've done a great job, right? Because we don't have time to take field notes in a situation like that. You have to rely strictly on now, you know, audio and video if you have it, which you probably will. In the old days, it was like, I think he said, right? So it's important to, as quickly as you can, begin taking notes. Obviously, if you're there as a backup officer, you're not able to do that. Any questions? Comments? Worries? You've been here the whole time, huh? No, I'm just kidding. I saw you. I just should have probably leaned on the pillar a little more. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I have to, uh, I have to say this, that regardless, I, I, how many of you are criminal justice majors? A few? Good. We, I met you in the, yeah, good to see you again. And good to see you again. Uh, and whatever profession you're headed to, uh, if you're in here, it's likely going to be, I mean, you are regardless, I guess, but all of you will be in some type of helping profession, uh, contributing to your communities, uh, making this world a little bit better place. I've had my chance. You know that I'm too old to do anything anymore. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, the, to change the world, it's up to you guys, right? It, it really is. It's your, it's your shot at it. Um, do the best you can. And I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you in advance for everything that you do and will do. I want to thank you in advance for everything you will do um, out there as you put your education to use. And thank you for having me tonight. I mean that sincerely. You know, my, my, uh, my children and family live in your communities as well. And uh, even though I'm pretty good, I think I'm pretty good at, and artful at protecting people and making good decisions, you're not there with them. They're, you know, your family's out in this community and uh, just like mine. So uh, we rely on others to do the right thing day in and day out. And uh, I applaud you for being here. I applaud you for being here at school tonight. And I want you to go home or wherever you go after this and thank someone else for uh, helping you be here tonight because there's a lot of sacrifice that goes on. Uh, just by you being here, you sacrifice, but there's a lot of support out there, isn't there, on your behalf. So don't forget to go home tonight and go, thank you. Okay? Thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs>